Greetings again from room 237. I trust that you are well. I trust that your extended families, your friends uh, continue well. I do want you to know that, that we uh, continue to pray for you, your community officers, elders and deacons, and Ford and I uh, meet together twice a week, Monday evening and Thursday during the lunch hour. Uh, just to share prayer requests, concerns that have uh, come up in the course of the week. And, um, and then we spend a good bit of that 40 minutes or so praying. Uh, if there is anything that you need, please don't hesitate to let us know. Let me know. Send me a text. Give me a phone call. Send me an email. Uh, we certainly want to pray uh, in a knowledgeable way for you. Uh, something I, I want to acknowledge and, and really give thanks for is the fact that our community has produced in the neighborhood of 500 masks. We're in the midst of this uh, drive to, to, to collect masks uh, to provide to the Neighborhood Christian Center and other ministry partners so that they can distribute them among the folks to whom they minister. The goal is 5,000 of those, as you probably saw in Sean's letter. We've, uh, we've been able to give 1,500 uh, so far, but about 500 of those has, have come from our community. So those of you who have participated in that, produced those masks, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's keep at it. Maybe we can win the blue ribbon for uh, the mask race. Uh, it's not really a race, um, just a little healthy competition among the communities. Uh, so thank you again for participating in that. Uh, some matters for prayer, uh, things that I do want to mention to you. We have a couple of uh, members who are in the midst of chemotherapy treatments, and I want to encourage you to continue to pray for them. Uh, Sherry Kylema uh, is receiving treatments um, uh, and on a weekly basis. Um, so please continue to pray for her and then pray for Lou Gettings as well. Uh, Lou is in the midst of chemotherapy treatments. Uh, he was about to begin phase two of those treatments, but his platelet count was, was low, and so that has been delayed a bit. Uh, pray for him that uh, those platelet numbers will come up and he can resume uh, his treatment. Keep those folks in your prayers. And then um, give thanks that Robin Callahan continues uh, to improve uh, and is recovering from uh, the COVID 19 um, uh, virus that uh, she contracted. Uh, Tom as well, they're very grateful for your prayers as I mentioned last week. So thank you uh, for keeping them in your prayers. And then uh, another thing I'd love to encourage you to pray about uh, is for our leaders, our local leaders, our mayors, and those advising them, our governor, not just our governor, but uh, the governors of, of all of the states, um, and then for our national leadership, for Vice President Pence, uh, for President Trump, uh, as they make decisions going forward as we uh, continue um, to shelter at home and uh, hope by our corporate actions to mitigate the effects of this uh, virus and particularly the transmission of it. But the thing I'm concerned about personally um, is that this not become a political issue. And my fear is that that is beginning to happen. So I would just ask you to pray that God would rule and overrule in the midst of the decision-making processes that these various levels uh, of leadership are engaged in uh, and that good and righteous and just and sound decisions will be made for the good of the people of this country uh, and beyond. Uh, please pray that God will rule and over, overrule uh, in that way. And thanks very much. We're encouraged, Paul encourages uh, Timothy to encourage his people to pray for the king, to pray for the emperor. And uh, the application for us is that we pray for our leaders at every level. So please be encouraged. Uh, to do that. 
Last week, we talked about the biblical idea of union with Christ. I want to return to that. I suggested at the end of the time last week that we might look at some passages in John's gospel, and I actually do want to do that. So let me pray for us, and uh, we're going to start in John chapter 14 after just a couple of comments to introduce this uh, idea again. But let's pray. Father, thank you that you love your people and that there is nothing that can separate us ever from your love. You have loved us, as Jeremiah acknowledges, you have loved us with an everlasting and undying love. And I pray for my friends, my fellow pilgrims, that as we find ourselves in this very challenging circumstance, Uh, And as we face other challenging circumstances, whether now or in the days to come or circumstances we have faced in the recent past, I pray that you would reassure your people that there is nothing in all the creation that can ever separate them from your love in and through Jesus Christ. As we meet today, as we talk about these passages, grant us your spirit I grant your spirit to me, grant your spirit to everyone who would who would listen to this, who would watch this, that your word might be a deep, deep comfort to your folks, to your people. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, last week we talked about this biblical idea of union with Christ. And why are we addressing this uh, at this particular time? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, And one of them is that we are in the midst of a challenging time. We're in the midst of a struggle. And whether this particular circumstance or other circumstances that are struggles, that are challenging, that are hard, um, the questions can arise for us. Is is God really for me? Uh, Is he for me? Um, Is there anything that can separate me from his love? Uh, There isn't a Christian on the planet who hasn't wondered that at at some point or other. Um, And Paul clearly addresses that. And that was the focus of Sean's final three sermons from Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31 and then through verse 39. Um, Is there anything that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? And not only... Paul's answer, but the Bible's answer is a very emphatic no. There there is nothing that can separate those whom the Father loves in the Son because of the Son's work from the love of the Father. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that leads then to the second reason for wanting to spend a little time here. It's because this idea of union with Christ being in Christ, being in the Lord, in the beloved, with Christ. Um, This this biblical truth lies beneath all of these blessings, uh, all of these benefits that come to us that we enjoy uh, as Christians. Just as a couple of examples, how can it be that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? How can Paul affirm that in in Romans 8 and verse 1? Well, the reason he can affirm that so uh, vigorously and unhesitatingly is because of what he says earlier in Romans chapter 6. For example, there are many places we could go, but this is one place. What shall we say then? Are Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it. Well, how did we die to sin? How did that happen? Well, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. His death was my death, his burial, my burial, his resurrection, my resurrection, his death, your death, his burial, your burial, his resurrection, your resurrection. Just as in Adam all die, 
Paul affirms in 1 Corinthians 16, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. As sin came to all men because of the sin of Adam, so righteousness and justification and all of these benefits come to all who are in Christ. So when Christ was crucified, when Christ died, when Christ was condemned, I was condemned. My sin was condemned. And the judgment and punishment for sin rendered against Christ result in my being vindicated because I am in him. John makes a very interesting, very interesting statement. I'm sure many of you have this passage memorized, 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, listen to this, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, isn't that striking? God is not only faithful to forgive our sins, but in that faithfulness, there is a justness. It is a just thing, a right thing, a righteous thing for God to forgive the sins of those who come to him confessing those sins. Why? Why is it just? Well, it is a just thing because justice was satisfied at the cross. And it would be an injustice on God's part for him to hold accountable one whose sin has already been addressed, whose sin has been forgiven, whose sin actually has been judged and condemned. If God were to hold guilty one who has been declared not guilty, that would be an injustice. But God is not unjust. He is just and right and good and righteous. And John touches on something that's profoundly significant, and it really does tie back to this idea of our being united to Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, so that Christ's death is my death, his burial is my burial, his resurrection is my resurrection. How can I know that nothing in all the creation will separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Well, this is what we looked at last week at, at some length. The question you want to ask is, how far does this union with Christ extend? And we, we saw last week that this union with Christ extends to eternity past. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to be adopted as his sons and his daughters, as his children. How far does this union with Christ extend? It's a mystery, to be sure. It's a profound mystery. But what Paul is telling us is that in the, in the councils of eternity, God purposed, before the foundation of the world, God purposed to save you in a Redeemer, Christ Jesus. He placed you in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. And what he purposed to do in time, he accomplished. Or what he purposed to do in eternity, he accomplished in time. Again, Romans chapter 6. In Christ's death, in Christ's burial, in Christ's resurrection, these benefits were secured and accrue to those whom the Father had given to Christ before the foundation of the world. And again, it's not just an objective thing. It's not just an external thing. It's not just a formal or a legal thing. It's an experiential thing. It's an existential thing. It's something that happens in me to me, as well as for me, not just outside of me, but in me. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man is in Christ, new creation. Anyone who has been united to Jesus Christ in time, 
by virtue of having been identified as in Christ before time and in Christ when Christ died, was buried, and raised, experientially, I am united to Jesus Christ and become part of the new creation that he is. Ephesians 2, uh, 1 through 3 tell us, uh, remind us that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But, but Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 and following remind us that God who is rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together with Christ, raised us up, seated us with him in the heavenly places, that in the ages to come he might show to us the riches of his kindness in Christ Jesus. You see, so experientially, now we are united to Christ, having been united to him in eternity past and in his death, resurrection, and in, and in his ascension. And the promise is that by virtue of our union with Christ, we will experience a resurrection like his. And again, that's Romans 6, verses 4 and 5. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. What does that mean? Well, it means that the day will come when our bodies, weak, frail, subject to death, eventually deteriorating and decaying unless Christ returns. Those bodies will be raised as Christ's body was raised, glorified, never to die again, perfected in union with souls that are perfectly holy, inherently, intrinsically, internally holy. Body and soul raised to newness of life, never to die again. So the question is, how, how is it? You know, we ask the question, um, it can, is there anything that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord? And the answer emphatically is no. I was united to Christ in eternity past. I'm united to Christ in his perfect work in securing my salvation. I'm united to him experientially, connected to him, so that I now participate in him as the new creation with the promise that one day this participation will become perfected, consummated, and body and soul fully restored and glorified. I will enjoy the full benefits, the full measure of the benefits that Christ has secured for me. So is there anything that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Absolutely not. And I love this statement that I believe I mentioned last week by Gerhardus Voss as he commented on Jeremiah 31, verse 3, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This is Voss's comment. The best proof that Christ will never cease to love us lies in that he never began. Christ never began to love us. He loved us because the Father had given us to him. And the Father and the Son together fixed their love upon a people. And then the Father gave Jesus to be the Savior of that people so that they might come to know life in all of its fullness. The best proof that Christ will never cease to love us lies in that he never began. Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. This idea of union with Christ, again, lies beneath all of these benefits, all of these blessings that we enjoy as Christians and the promise of the blessings that are yet to come. Now, I suggested to you last week that you find this idea of union actually in the teaching of Jesus himself. And I want to look with you for just a little bit of time at some passages from John's Gospel. Jesus uses different image, imagery. Um, as I mentioned last week, Paul, it seems to me, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 
uh, as Jesus revealed to him the gospel in its greater fullness. Uh, Paul in his letters unpacks this idea, but it originates with Jesus, this idea of being united to him or being in him. And I want you to listen to this language first that Jesus uses to describe his relationship to the Father. This is John chapter 14 and verses 8 through 11. This is Philip's exchange with Jesus. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. I begin with this passage because it seems to me that this passage helps us uh, to understand how Jesus talks about his relationship to us and with us as his people. And notice that Jesus and the Father are described as being in one another. The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Now, as you read through the Gospels, and I think in some ways especially in the Gospel of John, you'll run across these passages where there are these distinctions made between the persons of the Godhead, and this is one of them, where the distinct persons are clearly presented, and yet there is this, this intimacy, this essential union that is also depicted and presented for us. And that's what this passage is doing. There's no confusion of the persons of the Father and the Son, and yet there, there is this, this intimate union that exists between them, which is conveyed by this language of the Father being in the Son and the Son being in the Father. That diff different language, but that idea is present also in John chapter 10, this wonderful passage in which Jesus describes himself as the shepherd of the sheep and, and the door of the sheep. Um, verse, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Uh, I'm the good shepherd. Verse 14, I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And that, that language of knowing I, I trust you're aware, um, is, is a knowing that describes intimate relationship. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't something that describes an abstract or simply objective knowledge of someone or something, but it describes intimacy. That language is used all the way back in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 4, when, when the narrative in Genesis 4 um, puts the relationship between Adam and Eve in terms of knowledge and knowing. Adam knew his wife and she conceived and gave birth to a son. That's the most intimate depiction of a relationship that, that you'll find any place in the Bible or in human experience. Adam knew his wife and she conceived and gave birth to a son. That's the language that is being used here to describe Jesus and his relationship to his sheep. He knows his sheep and his sheep know him. There is an intimacy about them. And then, and then uh, later in John uh, chapter, uh, chapter 10, verse uh, 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. 
one in essence. That's what that language means. It doesn't, doesn't describe one in purpose or, or uh, one in terms of shared ideas or conceptions or something like that. It's a word that describes an essential oneness or union. The Father is in the Son. The Son is in the Father. The Father knows the Son. The Son knows the Father. The Savior knows the sheep, and the sheep know the Savior. Language of intimacy, while the distinction of persons is maintained. Now, if you proceed back in John 14, down to verses 15 and following, you, you get Jesus' um, initial instructions or teachings concerning the Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He dwells with you and will be in you. A couple of things to point out about this, uh, this short passage. First is the word another. Jesus promises that he will send another helper, or the Father will send another helper. Um, another, that word, uh, doesn't just refer to, to a replacement, um, somebody else who will come along. Um, but it actually it has a pretty narrow and pretty focused um, meaning and, and definition. Um, it describes not just a replacement, but one who will be like the one being replaced, like in every respect. And what Jesus is promising is that the Spirit will come as one who will be everything for the disciples that Jesus was for the disciples in his earthly ministry among them. He will be like Jesus in every respect, an exact and complete replacement, and yet distinct from Jesus. Distinction of person, but an exact replacement, being for the disciples what Jesus had been for them. And what's interesting is the disciples had some sense of this Jesus tells them that they had some sense of what the Spirit was like and what he would be like when he comes because he says, um, verse 18, you know him for he dwells with you. You know this one who is going to come and dwell in you because he dwells with you. Now, Jesus is not confusing the Spirit with himself. He's not suggesting that if you look at Jesus, you are looking at the Spirit. No, there's a distinction of persons in the Godhead, and the Spirit is still being differentiated from Jesus, from the Son. But it is that Spirit who rested upon Jesus in fulfillment of Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim release to the captives, the day of the Lord's favor. The Spirit rested upon Jesus at his baptism, and the disciples were witnesses to the empowering effects of the presence of the Spirit as the Spirit rested upon Jesus, indwelt Jesus, commissioned him for his ministry, empowered him for his ministry. The disciples were witnesses to that. That's what Jesus is referring to. You know him, for he dwells with you. How did he dwell with the disciples? He dwelt with the disciples as he rested upon Jesus, empowering Jesus for his ministry. And it is that very spirit, Jesus is saying, this is the third thing, it is that very spirit who will dwell in you. The Spirit will dwell in you. Now, you proceed then down to verses 19 to 23, this next passage. We read this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you little, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. 
because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, you in me, and I in you. Whoever keeps my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And we've just heard that it is the Spirit who is going to dwell in the disciples. But here Jesus says, in that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. So the question is, who is dwelling in the disciples? Well, it is the Spirit who is dwelling in the disciples. And it is the Father and the Son who will dwell in the disciples. Um, a little bit later, um, 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 verse 23, I just didn't read far enough. Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him or dwell in him. So here, here you have, I mean, it's, I suppose it's perplexing. It's a bit confusing. Uh, but here you have this promise that the very spirit who rested upon Jesus, empowering Jesus for his ministry, will come as a helper, will come as a comforter to the disciples and will dwell in them. And then you have Jesus saying that those who love him and who keep his commandments, they will become the habitation, the household, the dwelling place of the Father and the Son. So how are we to understand this? Well, we're to understand this in this way. It is the Spirit given by the Father and the Son who, who inhabits the believer and who is the means by which the believer has this intimate relationship with the Father and the Son. It's the Spirit who is the agent of this union that is effected between the believer and the Son together with the Father. And so the believer enjoys communion with all three persons of the Godhead. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, this language that is used. The Spirit will dwell in you. The Father and the Son will dwell, take, their, take up their habitation in you, and you will be in the Son, and you will be in the Father. See, it's that language of union, the very language that the Apostle Paul picks up that we've looked at uh, in Romans. Now, if you look at John chapter 15, and this, this comes out some in John chapter 14, but comes out again in John chapter 15, uh, verses 9 through 13. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Here's the thing that I want to point out about this. What is it that characterizes this communion that believers have through the Spirit with the Father and the Son? What's the central feature of it? It's love. Jesus said it in chapter 14. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And then here again, there's a lot that could be said about um, the imagery that Jesus uses earlier in the chapter chapter 15 about being the, the the vine and we're the branches and we're to abide in him and and that it's only by abiding in him remaining in him that we are fruitful that we can bear fruit the fruit of righteousness but what characterizes this union is love and joy i've spoken this to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This union that we experience with Christ 
is a union characterized by love and characterized by joy. Remember Ephesians chapter 2. In love, he predestined you to adoption as sons, as sons and daughters, as children of God. So I was thinking about this passage or these passages and just sort of reading through them and reflecting on them and getting ready to do this. Uh, this morning, I happened to think again of this essay that Jonathan Edwards wrote, which I've mentioned to you before. Uh, the essay is entitled, The End for Which God Created the World. Why did God create the world? I, I, my interactions with you, conversations with you, I, you, some of you have mentioned that to me. I mean, why, why did God do this? Why did God create the world? Why, why the fall? Why sin? Why all of the, why did, God didn't have to do this. No, that's exactly right. He didn't have to do this. The Father and the Son and the Spirit lived in eternity in the fullness of their own love and joy and delight in one another. Edwards unpacks this. So the question is, why does, why does God, who is perfectly happy in himself, create the world? And the answer that Edwards gives, as I understand Edwards, is this, God created the world so that he might glorify himself by distributing on the objects of his affection, those whom he loves, the joy of his own eternal existence. God created the world so that he might glorify himself by distributing upon the objects of his affection, the joy of his own existence. That's Johannine. What is it that characterizes this union that we have with Christ? It is love. The Father's love for you. The Son's love for you. The Spirit is the agent of this union who brings this love of the Father and of the Son to you, to your experience. And Jesus promising that his purpose in this union is that you might know joy, the fullness of his joy. Do you know it perfectly in this life? No. But just talking about this, just thinking about this, doesn't it, doesn't it whet your appetite for more? Doesn't it stir up your desires to pursue this love and this joy which are found in the Father and the Son, mediated to us by the Spirit, as the Spirit unites us to the Father and to the Son. Do we experience it fully now? Absolutely not. But is there the promise that the day is coming when we will know it in all of its fullness? There absolutely is. Just a couple of final verses and then a final illustration. John chapter 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer. I, even though we're, we're past Easter and, and we're in this period, um, post-Easter period between Ascension and Pentecost, and um, I, I just would encourage you to read John chapter 17 and reflect upon it. Uh, the first three verses pick up some of this language that, uh, that Jesus uses, some of this imagery that Jesus has used previously. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, so that he might give eternal life to all whom you have given him. The Father gave a people to the Son, and then the Father has given all authority over all flesh, so that he might give eternal life to those whom the Father had given him. 
And it is in the cross where Christ secures that eternal life for those whom the Father had given to him. And then he says, verse 3, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. There's only one place in the Bible where eternal life is defined, and it's right here. And it is defined in terms of intimate, personal relationship. It is defined in terms of union with the Father and with the Son. And what does Jesus want for you? What does he want for all of those whom he loves? Do you know what the last request is that Jesus made of his Father before he went to his cross, before he went to the Passion? His last request is recorded in John chapter 17, beginning at verse 23 or 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now remember that, remember that that oneness, that unity, is not a confusion of persons. The Father remains distinct from the Son, the Son distinct from the Father, the Spirit distinct from the Father and the Son. The creature always remains distinct from the Creator. There's no confusion of persons uh, or of uh, creator and creature. And yet there is a union, a oneness that Jesus tells us is ours as we believe in him. The glory that you have given me, I've given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. There it is again. What characterizes this union is love. And then Jesus makes this final request. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. Jesus is facing the cross. He's facing betrayal, arrest, a kangaroo court, an unjust judgment or an unjust judgment against him, and then execution, sentencing and execution, and the passion of the cross. But the thing that he asks before he goes to all of that is that you might be with him where he is. Why? Because he has loved you with an everlasting love. And those who love want those whom they love to be with them. I've shared this with you before. I struggle with Christmas now because we have these three sons-in-law and we have to share our daughters, the objects of our affection. We have to share them with in-laws. What is it that makes Christmas Christmas? It's not the presents, it's not the tree. It's being together. It's having them be at home. And that is what Jesus longs for, for you. And the day will come when he will bring you safely home. Now, I have to read something that I think I've read before from J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. It's one of the most stunning passages to me in all of the stuff that I've read. And I haven't read nearly as much as a whole lot of other people have read. But I've read a fair amount over the course of the last nearly 50 years as a Christian. And this is one of the most stunning passages I think I've ever read. It's from J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God, in the chapter entitled, The Love of God. This is what he writes. We have in previous chapters made the point that God's end in all things is his own glory, that he should be manifested, known, admired, adored. And this statement is true, but it is incomplete it needs to be balanced by a recognition 
that through setting his love on men, God has voluntarily bound up his own final happiness with theirs. It is not for nothing that the Bible habitually speaks of God as the loving father and husband of his people. It follows from the very nature of these relationships that God's happiness will not be complete till all his beloved ones are finally out of trouble, till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. God was happy without man before man was made. He would have continued happy had he simply destroyed man after man had sinned. But as it is, he has set his love upon particular sinners. And this means that by his own free voluntary choice, he will not know perfect and unmixed happiness again until he has brought every one of them to heaven. He has in effect resolved that henceforth, for all eternity, his happiness shall be conditional upon ours. Thus, God saves not only for his glory, but also for his gladness. I don't understand this, but somehow Jesus will not be glad in the fullest and most complete sense of that word until you're home with him. That's what he prayed for before his passion. That's why he intercedes for you as your great high priest right now. That is why he rules and reigns for you as your king and the king of glory. And that's why he's coming again, because he will not rest, he will not be satisfied until you, the one whom he has loved with an everlasting love, he has brought safely home to himself. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, bless my friends. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for what they do to my own heart, even as I talk about them now. May they continue to encourage me. May they continue to strengthen my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.